right, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host over here on the end, <laughs> uh, Krista Porter here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics of interest to librarians. Um, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it is then posted onto our website, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, we cover a mixture of things here. For those of you not um, Nebraska local, uh, we are the Nebraska Library Commission is a state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that's for all types of libraries. So we do have topics on our show that are for public, K-12, academic, um, universities, schools, uh, correction facilities, special museums. Uh, we run the gamut. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries which is very broad. <laughs> uh, so you should be able to find anything that might be of interest to you. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products we think you may be interested in. Um, so um, we're all over the board here, which I think is great. Um, but we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations about things that are specific to what we are offering here, but we also bring in guest speakers sometimes. And today we have a mixture of that. Um, this morning, we are talking about the 2019 One Book, One Nebraska selection. Um, and I think I may just hand over to you, Tessa, if you're going to sure. be doing, you know, guiding us through today. And um, we'll introduce everybody as we're going through this and everything. You'll know what we're all doing here, but this is what we're talking about today. Yeah, so like Chris said, we are talking about the 2019 One Book, One Nebraska selection, This Blessed Earth, by our author, Ted Genoing. Um, I'm Tessa Terry. I'm the communications coordinator here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And we'll just go around and make sure everyone knows who we are. This I'm, is Ted. Ted Jenner, our right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Becky Faber. I uh, am on the Center for the Book Board and half chair of the One Book One Nebraska Selection Committee. I'm Rod Wagner. I'm director of the Library Commission and a Ex officio member of the Nebraska Center for the Book Board. And, and also, oh, go ahead, Christine. Oh, and okay. I'm Christine Walsh, and I'm out in Kearney. I'm the president of Center for the Book Board and was also on the selection committee for the One Book, One Nebraska. Well, why don't um, we start out just kind of explaining if our listeners don't know what the One Book, One Nebraska program is, and I'll let Becky. Give us a little backstory about that. Thank you, Tessa. This is the 15th selection of One Book, One Nebraska, which is a program where um, a single selection is chosen for residents of Nebraska to all be reading and discussing the same book. <coughs> the, um, I'm going to talk about the traditional process because our process this year was a little bit different. But traditionally, we're looking for a book that meets one of three criteria, uh, either written by a Nebraska author, has a Nebraska theme, or has a Nebraska setting. And the book must have an ISBN and must be readily available across the state for readers. Ordinarily, our nominations come from the public, and um, we encourage people to nominate books fitting within those criteria, uh, meeting at least one of those criteria. And um, then there is a selection committee from the Center for the Book that reads, makes sure that uh, the books have met what is necessary uh, to be available across the state and then narrows the selection. When we reach a short list, uh, which is early in the fall, that short list is generally publicized so that the public has an idea of uh, the direction that we're headed. And uh, that's great fun to be able to release that short list. And then uh, the actual selection itself is uh, 
uh, voted on by the board, and that is named at the celebration of books. Now, one of the things that we do want people to know is um, this year has been a little bit different as a joint program with all Iowa Reads, but for the 2020 selection, we will be returning to our normal process and will be accepting nominations for the 2020 selection through the 15th of June. And the information for nomination is on um, the website. So you can go there and see. I believe there are two ways that um, those can be nominated. So I went the wrong way. <laughs> so we've been doing One Book One Nebraska for this is our 15th year, mm -hmm. and um, we've got a little slide here of all the books we've had in the past, and they really cover a wide variety of topics. Um, last year we had a poetry anthology, mm -hmm. um, so you can get a feel on the website and get a more information about each book on the Center for the Book One Book One Nebraska page. So. Why don't we talk a little bit about the unique selection process for this year's book? I know we worked with the Iowa Center for the Book with it. Yes? Yes, we did. Um, what was that process like? How many books did you guys look at as a joint committee? We were approached by the All Iowa Reads Committee in the summer of 2017. Um, with the idea of doing a joint selection, <clears throat> excuse me, for 2019. And uh, the board agreed uh, that we would do that. This is a one time only project. So obviously, um, the logistics had to be fine tuned, and this was done um, via the wonders of current technology. <laughs> there were 16 people who were engaged in this from the start, eight from each state. So we did have um, very much balanced input. And our initial number of nominations was 27. Um, we worked through the uh, nominations and just uh, continued to do reading. And this was an immense amount of reading. <laughs> and then we would uh, telecommunicate. We would talk about books. Uh, and just continue to narrow the number down. Um, and by the end of the summer, we had uh, narrowed down to eight and then down to five. And that short list of five was released in early October. And then um, our ultimate choice, the, this Blessed Earth, which was announced um, later this fall, last fall. Great. Uh, Christy, were you on that committee? I was. What about this Blessed Earth checked all the boxes that you guys needed for a joint One Book One Nebraska? Um, a book that engages you to really think and um, gives us opportunities for great discussions and I think opportunities to educate. Are there other um, groups, other points of view that can be brought in to engage too, because I think the opportunity, it, books expand the mind. And if we can continue to do that and make it a thoughtful selection, I think that's extremely important. And certainly this book does all of those things. So I'm looking forward to um, the year of discussions and um, I don't know, sharing across the state and then having Ted, of course, come in and interact with the readers because people are very excited. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Ted, to talk a little bit about your book. Well, first, I, I have to thank everyone assembled and, and, and everyone involved in the selection process. <clears throat> Obviously, it's a, um, a distinguished group to, to join um, the, the authors who have been um, selected in years past. It especially means a lot to me um, that two of the past year's uh, selections were, were books by Bill Clefcorn and Ted Kuzer, um, both of whom were uh, professors of mine when I was an undergraduate. So um, it, it, I just I can't say enough about what it means to 
to, to join them in, in this group of, of authors who've been selected. Um, in talking about the book and introducing the book a little bit, I, I felt like it was necessary to talk a little bit about um, what's what's happened and what you may have seen in the last 10 days in terms of uh, press attention. Um, as you may have seen, uh, the, the the governor of Nebraska um, declined to sign the, the, the official proclamation for the one book, one Nebraska selection. Um, and the reason that that was cited was this uh, his belief um, that the book uh, is is divisive, and he said that he wanted to have something that instead brought together the people of Nebraska. Um, I would first, I guess, note that the governor also says that he hasn't read the book, um, but second and more importantly, um, to say that that the goal of this book is couldn't be farther from this suggestion that, that I'm trying to divide people. In fact, the, the whole notion of this book in the first place was to try to have something um, that would show uh, the, the sort of uh, commonality that, that I, I think that there is um, for this, this sort of rural experience in uh, not only in Nebraska, but across the, the middle of the country. And so um, one of the things also that I think is, is important to note is that the, the inspiration for this um, really came when uh, my wife and I were doing, uh, and you're, you're going to see some of her photographs here in just a moment, Marianne Andre, whose photos are also in the book. Um, Marianne and I had been doing uh, reporting together on the, the Keystone XL pipeline and the controversy surrounding the pipeline. And um, one of the things that we uh, discovered as we were covering this issue was how ill-informed a lot of reporters who were arriving from the coast seemed to be about especially rural life in the middle of the country. And so there were a lot of kind of, uh, I think, well-intentioned but often uh, ill-mannered or uninformed questions that were asked. Um, you know, it was it was always a little bit cringe-inducing to see reporters arriving from New York, and the first questions out of everybody's mouth was, you know, how many acres people had and how many cattle they were running, um, and seeing again and again as farmers and ranchers would respond, how much money do you have in your bank account? Um, and it was just that there was a there was a cultural divide there. And we started talking about how we might um, make the, the, the farmers and ranchers who we had been covering more than just props in, in stories about the politics uh, surrounding something like the pipeline project, and instead try to give people a deep understanding um, of place and of the people who live in that place. Marianne was the one who first had the idea of selecting the Hammonds and following them for a year. Um, I don't know if we can put up the slides of oh, the... Sure. Yeah. Uh, the Hammond family. Okay. Slide, Introduce you to the Hammonds here one by one. Um, Megan Hammond was our, our first contact. Um, she was someone who Marianne had met uh, originally at, at a protest in Washington, D.C. that Marianne was photographing um, related to the pipeline. Um, Megan was uh, brash enough that, that she approached Marianne, wanted to know what she was doing there, taking photos of the Nebraska group of protesters. Uh -huh. um, and, uh -huh. uh, and they quickly hit it off. And what, what we found out from spending some time with the, with the Hammond family was that not only was the, the, the piece of ground that Megan and her then boyfriend, um, now husband, we're in the process of taking over um, 
slated to be crossed by the, the Keystone XL pipeline. But the family was also, I think, uh, quite representative of a number of other um, issues that, that have been facing rural America. M Megan lost her high school boyfriend um, to a roadside bomb in Iraq, um, and which gave us some opportunity to address the sort of disproportionate um, presence of, of rural uh, people in especially young men in the military. Um, but there was also the, the fact that the, the Hammonds as a family had really come around to this idea that they wanted to try to engage in a different kind of agriculture than the conventional agriculture that they had been engaged in, but were really ex experiencing some practical struggles with that transition. We can go to the next slide. Megan's father, uh, Rick Hammond, who is very much the, the, the patriarch of the family and, and sort of the, um, the guiding wisdom of, of the operation. Um, Rick grew up on a, on a ranch in uh, western Nebraska, in Curtis, Nebraska, um, and in some ways has uh, what I think Megan finds to be old-fashioned ideas about especially the, the cattle operation, um, a, a kind of throwback rancher's uh, notion of things. Um, but Rick is also very much an environmentalist and thinks of himself as, as a steward um, first and foremost. And so um, Rick had experimented with trying to move over to raising antibiotic-free um, beef and also experimented with raising organic crops and had really experienced difficulty along the way. And um, so talking about the, the challenge of that um, transition was, was also uh, something that, that we wanted to, to speak about. And then uh, last in that group is, is Kyle Galloway, who is, as I said, Megan's uh, husband now, was her boyfriend at the time that uh, we spent that year with the family. And um, Kyle, for me, provided a kind of perfect um, conduit that he was very much a part of the family um, and really embraced by Rick as someone who had and has this wide range of skills and this tremendous work ethic that made him instantly indisposable on the farm. But Kyle also arriving um, as he did, um, not only from uh, outside of the, the immediate sphere of the family, having he grew up in Iowa, um, but Kyle is adopted and where the, the Hammonds have this, this deep uh, sense of, of family roots. Kyle, um, you know, doesn't doesn't even know who his his birth parents are, and so he approached everything with the Hammonds uh, family as something of an outsider and 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 someone who was learning the ropes and and learning the history, and was always someone who I could rely on to have a conversation. Uh, about what was going on in the family and, and do a little bit of figuring out of, of that dynamic together. And then also just wanted to introduce you a, a little bit to the, the, the farm operation itself. So like so many farms today, um, there is, there's a central farm that has been in the family since the 1870s. Um, it was purchased in 1874 and, and really uh, established as, as a functioning operation in 1876, and for that reason uh, was named Centennial Hill Farm. Um, I would defy anyone who goes to that spot to find me the hill that is on that farm, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it is ever so slightly higher than the other spots around, so it does drain and uh, was something that that very much appealed to uh, Megan Hill. exactly <laughs> Megan's original ancestors. Um, constellated around that center of gravity, that that farm um, 
that is the, the original plot um, in York County are other pieces of ground that the, that the Hammonds have picked up over the years to add to their operation and, and increase the, the volume to make the margins of the operation work. Um, this particular piece of ground that you see here um, is in Hamilton County, just over the line, just west um, of uh, where Centennial Hill Farm is, just south of Central City. Um, one of the other things that I should note that appealed to me about the Hammond family is that this particular piece of ground south of Central City is about 20 miles east of the, the farm where my grandfather grew up. And so um, a lot of the, the landmarks and the um, sort of points of, of familiarity, both in terms of, of the Platte River where it cuts through there, um, but also um, where they would go when going to town and that sort of thing, were all uh, familiar locations for me from, uh, from my family. As you can see, they, they have uh, a cattle operation that's, that's one part of what they do. The, they have uh, Black Angus cattle. I won't tell you how many they have. Um, and then, as you can see here from the top of the, of the uh, grain bin, uh, they have a, a, a operation that alternates between corn and soybeans um, and, again, is is planted on, on farms that are sort of scattered around Hamilton and, and York counties. Okay, and so the, and I don't know if you can let these just run, but the, the, uh, the other, the photos that, that you'll see here, um, essentially what we did as this project, once we had gotten the Hammonds to uh, agree to the sort of incredible uh, imposition of having um, two people who kept showing up at, at inopportune times throughout an entire year um, was follow them from harvest of 2014 to harvest of 2015. When we originally made that proposal and the Hammonds agreed, um, everything was going well in the, the farm economy. And it was an easy thing for them to say yes because what it appeared was that we would be showing up and seeing everything at its best. Instead, over that summer, um, prices crashed for, for soybeans and corn and really started the, the farm economy that, that we know at this moment. Um, as all of the farmers who are uh, planning this rotation are scrambling to try to figure out how they're going to keep their operations afloat as prices have dropped about 50% from where they were. Um, so it was a remarkable leap of faith on the part of the Hammonds that they allowed us to come um, in the midst of, of what was a sort of emerging crisis for the farm and for all farms uh, across the middle of the country and for us to see as they were making hard decisions and um, and real choices that that they knew would affect the the future of the farm uh, at this critical moment, as Megan and Kyle were moving toward marriage and moving toward taking over um, part of the operation uh, as their own. So, I can I can do a, a short reading, but before I do that, I, I just wonder if there are any questions at this point mm -hmm. from participants. Yeah, sure. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and type into the questions section of the um, GoToWebinar interface. We can grab anything from there. I'm monitoring that here. I'm off camera here now, but on the laptop so we can... Um, any comments or anything? So while we're on that picture of Kyle, um, while people um, have, have that, that photo in front of them, um, I, I wanted to just read a, a, a passage from the book that, that relates directly to that, to that photo. Um, so 
the 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 photo there in question. Um, I was going to have everybody look at that instead of yep. looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're both going to be interested. Don't you worry, we um, the, the, the photo there in question is uh, on a particular evening during harvest of the first year that, that we were uh, with the, the Hammonds. And, and obviously, um, not only was I there, but, but Marianne was there, and we were in the cabs alternating with, with the Hammonds as they um, were harvesting a field of soybeans. You can see from the head on the harvester that that's the soybean reel that that um, is sort of the distinctive uh, head on on the harvester at that part of the of the harvest. Um, and then there is also the the grain cart that everything um, offloads onto. And we were trading back and forth from those places. Um, the uh, so it's a it's a bit of a of a of a setup, but the uh, the Hammonds were harvesting this field for a neighbor who they shared costs on the rental on the harvester, and a pretty typical arrangement where this half million dollar piece of equipment no one um, wanted to purchase just for 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 use once a year. So you rent it, you've got a short period of time that you can use it, and so it places this pressure on trying to get everything complete before you lose use of the harvester. Um, so everything is um, about timing at that point, and um, Rick uh, is, is throughout the book and in life is always sort of erring on the side of caution where Kyle, um, with some youth and some, uh, I would say, ambition is, is always sort of trying to push things forward. At this particular moment, the thing that, that I thought was so remarkable was that the, the conversation, you can see that the sun was setting low, and the conversation was whether or not to continue harvesting for the evening. Um, it was not a question of how anyone was feeling or work ethic or any of those sorts of things. It had to do with a, a discussion about what happens when the sun starts to set, the moisture in the air comes up. If soybeans get too moist, they're impossible to cut, and the harvester, um, instead of cutting the, the plants cleanly, will shake the plants and shatter and scatter the the soybeans that you're trying to harvest. You lose the, the beans that you're trying to, to bring in. Um, but Kyle had also checked on his, on his smartphone and could see that there was uh, a price dip that was expected to come the next day based on how uh, soybeans were trading in China at that very moment. So he was plugged into the markets halfway around the world and making a decision that if they could bring those beans in that, that evening and get them to an elevator and they'd found an elevator that was willing to stay open for them uh, late that night and give them the price that the beans had been traded at that day, that they could uh, make additional profit off of, of that field. The trade-off is that if you, if anything goes wrong as the sun is coming down and things are getting dark, um, that that there's always the the, the possibility for uh, for injury, for accident, and Rick was constantly saying, um, you know, only bad things happen in the dark. To to make this additionally complicated, and I'll explain this. I'll read from this passage. <coughs> Um, the, this particular field that was planted by the neighbor was not planted by GPS, but was planted by I. And so what they had to do, and it was also, I guess, should be noted, planted with a, with a planter that was 
uh, that was narrower than the harvester that they were working on. So what this meant was that you had to almost row by row, site down and figure out where you were going to follow and, and follow the, uh, the lines as they had been planted. You couldn't do it automatically as they sometimes do and frequently do these days. Um, and of course, losing the visibility, there was always the possibility that you would um, do what they call laying down rows, where you get offline and instead of cutting, you're, you're laying the plants down. So I'll read from that passage. And Seth, by the way, is, is the neighbors. As the sun started to set, the mood seemed to shift with it. Because Seth had planted by eye, every turn of the combine required lining up with where he had tried to match row spacing between each pass at planting. Farmers call these guest rows. The 16 rows laid out by the planter are perfectly spaced, but the furrow between passes can be slightly narrower or slightly wider than the machine spaced rows. Because the harvester is 12 rows wide, it's impossible to split each, planted, each planting swath. Instead, you have some, some passes within the planted pattern and some where the harvester is straddling the, the places where two planting rows come together. But as the light failed and the shadows grew longer, it was getting harder and harder for Kyle to keep track of the guest rows and remain within the pattern. He leaned forward, peering down over the steering wheel to be sure that the spinning reel of the harvester was standing up the rows and cutting everything cleanly. Seth, back in the spring, had planted across, had planted around the concrete platform of his new center pivot for the first time. And rather than setting his row spacing starting from that platform, he'd started from the edge of the field and worked in. Ordinarily, farmers won't plant closer than 30 inches from their pivot. But Seth, hoping to get a little extra from that field, had allowed just five inches. So as they neared the platform, Rick and Kyle had to figure out where to set the floating bar on the outside of the harvester head, what they called the snout, in order to stay aligned but without having to take multiple passes to get around the pivot. We try to put the outside of that head on the guest row, Kyle explained, but the eye planted rows can sometimes run together. And if you don't guess right, you're taking half a swath trying to fix it, which takes fuel and time. And if you get off by too much, you miss a guest row and don't notice, or just try to keep going, you can start to run over rows, breaking the pods, or treading the plants into the mud, muddy soil and making them impossible to harvest. Seeing the trouble it was causing, Seth told them not to worry about the rows right around the pivot. But even in a neighbor's field, Kyle wanted to capture every bit of the yield. So between passes, he would come down from the cab, study the rows with Rick, and then hustle back behind the wheel. At dinner time, Megan drove to pick up food, Heidi, Rick's wife had waiting for them at the house. Megan returned with tacos wrapped up in aluminum foil and a cooler full of Cokes. Everyone sat at the tailgate of the pickup or leaned against the bed, eating quickly. Rick kept eyeing the sun, now sinking into the line of trees that stood behind or between the edge of the field and Seth's house. I think we should call it a night, Rick said finally. It's all right, Kyle said. There's just a few more swaths. If you advance a photo or two here, this is them harvesting. This is that conversation. So you can see sort of how it's going. Um, Kyle was hoping to finish this field before it was full dark so they could load up the head and the combine for another field for tomorrow. If they could get done in the next hour, they would have a jump in the morning. Together, Rick and Kyle walked over to the remaining rows getting a read on how many rounds were, were left to complete the field, but also going back and forth about whether to continue or stop. Finally, Kyle won out. He took the combine down to the north edge of the field, then turned back toward the pivot, watching the spinning reel below him and steadying the wheel. As he neared the south edge of the field, Megan, waiting in the grain cart, came on the radio. You're driving crooked, she said. You're knocking over rows. Kyle looked down at the reel. 
everything seemed in line. So he stopped the harvester and climbed down to see what was going on. Right away he could see. The snout was bent in, and the plastic bo body of the soybean head was broken. He'd hit the pad of the pivot and never even felt it. God damn it, Kyle rasped under his breath. This could be thousands of dollars of damage. Worse still, if it was more than he could fix himself, it could be days of waiting for a John Deere certified mechanic. He pulled back the plastic body and he stuck his head inside. Kyle told me later that he could see that the snout had been pushed in and bent up the hydraulic arm on which it floats. <laughs> that arm was rubbing on a pulley belt that runs the cutting sickles, pulling, putting slack in the system and creating thick friction. It was still cutting, Kyle said, but it was already getting really, really hot. He reached in to see if he could straighten the bent arm by, ha by hand. No dice. I should have just left that row, Kyle said, still tugging hard on the arm. It was planted right up against the pad. That's what Seth said, Rick snapped. You cannot harvest something that's planted that close. Yeah, I probably should have just left that little bit. If Megan wouldn't have seen it, it could have started a fire, Rick said. He couldn't hide his anger, but Kyle was already thinking about what needed to what they needed to do now. He said he could straighten the arm if he could just heat it up, but he couldn't afford to wait until morning to fix it. If they were going to finish this field in the morning and still stand a chance of loading up and getting some beans out of their own fields, Kyle was going to have to make the repairs right then in the dark. He asked Seth if he had a cutting torch and a wrench he could borrow. Seth told them to pull around to his shop and he set off across the field. By the time Kyle and Rick had driven up to the pickup, driven up in the pickup, Seth had already rolled out a portable light and the tank and a hose and a rosebud heating tip for the torch. He grabbed a couple of wrenches. Kyle asked if he had any fender washers. Seth pulled out a box and shook several out into his hand. Hoping to get out of the way, I went with Megan back to the house where we waited, saying little for close to an hour before Rick and Kyle came rolling into the driveway. They stomped into the mudroom, laughing and kicking off their boots. You asked for that fender washer, and Seth just said, how many you need, Rick said, slapping Kyle on the back. Why can't I have a shop like that? I assume everything's working, Megan called from across the kitchen. Yeah, Kyle said with a long sigh. We had to drill out some rivets and get the plastic bent up so that we could get the torch in without burning everything up. And then we had to heat up that arm and get it straightened out so it quit rubbing. It was really hard steel and we couldn't get it bent by hand. And then a little piece on the backside broke, so we had to weld that back together. Rick interrupted. I want you guys to know, the combine is better than it's ever been. Better than before, Megan asked skeptically. At least, Rick said. We should hit every center pivot pad. <laughs> Before long, they were seated together around the dinner table, recounting stories of all the near disasters of past years. The time Dave, their hired man, took out a power line with the unloading auger. The time Megan had swung wide to make a turn on a country road with the bean head strapped onto the flatbed trailer and clipped a stop sign. They laughed until all the tension and worry of the accident the adrenaline of what could have happened had been shaken off and disappeared. So, some glimpse of the family, both uh, the tension that can arise and, and also how quickly they, they fly into action and come together. Um, we do have some questions here. I don't know if you want to. That'd be great. Okay. Um, so here's a question. How have farmers reacted to this book? So the the <laughs> thing that's been most um, gratifying to me is to hear um, people who are still farming and people who have grown up on farms say that that they feel like the book gets right all of the, the tensions and all of the the pressures of, of farm life today. My, 
my sense is that you know that that Megan in particular always kept, you know kept saying I I don't want people to think that I you know I wake up in the morning and and get my my milk pail and go across the field of daisies to milk the the, the cow. <laughs> So like I, I want people to know what it's it's really like to live on a farm, and so you know the Hammonds were really open and really transparent about um, what everything was like. They were um, really willing to let us be right in the middle of the action as things were happening, and to answer questions about what was happening when we didn't understand um, all the complexities. And I I really think you know, the extent to which this has been embraced by farmers and, and sort of endorsed in that way is a is a tribute to how open and forthcoming the Hammonds were with us at every stage throughout that year. So we've got a few more questions sure. um, about how the Hammonds have reacted to this book and its selection by Nebraska and Iowa as their state reads. Yeah, so th it, this has been, um, it's an interesting and complicated thing for the Hammonds. The, um, in the introduction to the book, um, I talk about the fact that, that they, in the, the fight against Keystone XL, had, had taken a really public stance and had really they'd given a lot of interviews. Um, and that public profile had led um, the group Bold Nebraska to approach Rick about building a solar and wind powered barn on some of uh, his farm ground. And he agreed to do that, um, though it cut into their profits by eliminating that part of the field. Um, but it was also ground that sat directly across the road from rented property. And um, the neighbor who they had rented from, from for many, many years, didn't like all the attention, didn't like all of the, the sort of presence of, of uh, protesters from Bold as they came and used the, the, what they call the solar barn as the backdrop. And they canceled the contract that, that Rick had had um, to farm that ground for many years, which presented a really serious financial hit for the Hammonds. And so their hyper aware that that every time they open their mouths, every time they talk to a reporter, writer like me, and I go out and say what they've said, that it puts their operation at some risk if there's a neighbor who doesn't like it. And so um, they've asked, you know, that that I go out and speak about the book, but they're, they see their role as complete and I absolutely respect that. Um, I talked to Kyle a few days ago to, to see how mm -hmm. everybody's doing in, in light of uh, some of the publicity that had come uh, after the some of the comments from the governor. Um, and I thought it was absolutely typical of the Hammond family that I asked Kyle, you know, if there were any questions that were being asked. And he said, you know, a few people have asked me um, about what's going on, and he said, I told them that they should read the book just like the governor should. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Um, and then another question, what's your overall takeaway about family farming from your experience writing this, Lassiter? I mean, the, my main takeaway, I suppose, is that, um, that farming has always been dangerous and difficult and high pressure it's you're always at the mercy of the weather and the, the fickle markets um, and but all of those things have become even more difficult and more high pressure and high stakes as the technology has evolved and the decision making is in fewer and fewer hands and each each farmer is expected to be responsible for more and more acres uh, a, a cousin of mine who um, for many years ran the, 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 a section of the tri-state irrigation ditch in western Nebraska told me a few years ago that, that you know, it was not unusual when he was younger to see an operation that was 800 acres as a huge operation. 
Um, now he was explaining to me that it was not unusual to see 8,000 acres um, in the in the hands and that it, under the responsibility of a single farmer. What that means is that that every uh, gamble, um, the effects of it are magnified, and um, every time someone guesses, or as as the saying goes, every time you bet the farm and and guess wrong, the consequences could be really severe. And so it's it is that cousin of mine, Austin. Um, he always said, you know, that that gam that that farmers were the were the biggest gamblers he knew. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's truer every year that the, that the way that, that you can kind of survive in this kind of environment is by guessing and guessing right. But that gets harder and harder for an individual to do year to year. And so it, it puts tremendous pressure on families. And of course, what that means going forward is that more and, and more young people decide that they don't want to continue on the farm, that they would rather um, go into town, go to the cities and find work. And, uh, and very often the, the farm ends up changing hands. Uh, one of the things that struck me with, with the Hammonds, as I mentioned, there's that, that central piece of, of land they have, but then all these other pieces around, they still refer to all of those pieces of ground by the name of the people that they bought them from. They still think of them as being the possession of somebody else who's no longer there and in some cases hasn't farmed the, the ground for a generation or more. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very common um, that that there's this, this what I refer to as sort of this ghost geography, the, the, the places um, that no longer exist that, that people still remember and still navigate by. Um, my, my father who grew up on a farm in, in western Nebraska, I always give him a bad time because the, the, when he's trying to direct me when, when we're out there and visiting those places, he's always navigating by landmarks that no longer exist. <laughs> um, and so he's, it's always, you know, turn north where the store used to be, turn right where the old farmhouse stood, and then you go north again where the school used to be. Um, and I, I think that's, that's indicative of just how high pressure this is. And when you live in that landscape, reminded constantly that, that if you fail, you, you sort of disappear from, from that landscape. Um, it's, it's a daily pressure. So we have some good questions about um, book club groups and more discussion, which kind of yeah. um, moves us into talking about how Nebraskans are engaging in this book. So the commission itself has 20 books that in our book club kit currently that we already have um, 13 reservations for throughout the year. And we have such a backlog that we've ordered 20 more books for our book club kit. But um, we've got some good questions just about um, your wife, Mary Ann's um, site and the photographs from this project and about how they can be used as a complement to a small group book discussion, yeah. um, which is a great idea. That's what we're doing today. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, what these photos yeah. are from, correct? Yes. Yeah. And, and I'll say that, that um, there's a, that, so the book is constructed in, according to the four seasons, um, if you go to my website, which is just tedgenoways.com, you'll find that there are excerpts from each of the, the four seasons, which is intended to give people a, a kind of brief introduction to the, um, the challenges of, uh, that are going to be discussed in each of those sections. But you'll also find in each season about 15 photographs of, of Marianne's, which are there to, again, uh, it, give people some sense of uh, of who the Hammonds are visually and, and just that sense of things. And all of those photos um, are available. I'm, I'm glad to use them in presentations. And whenever possible, 
um, would also love to have Marianne along to talk about her experience of photographing the Hammonds and supplement the, uh, the a book presentation in that way as well. Okay. So we have a question that I, two questions that I'm going to join together. Um, will you be doing a speaking tour in Nebraska and Iowa? And then what do you most look forward to as you present and discuss your book? Yeah, so um, as I told Rod and Becky when the, they first approached me about this and asked what my availability would be, um, for the first half of this year, I'm, I'm on a uh, writing deadline, which for me means that I'm looking for absolutely any excuse to be out of the house. <laughs> so if you if you want to have me for an event, I am um, I'm absolutely available. And, it's, and the best part is that uh, what could be a better excuse for my publisher than, than to say that I was out I was selling so the busy last book? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I was trying to help you. Um, so uh, so yes, I'm 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 absolutely available. Uh, I I am freelancing full time, so uh, my schedule is extremely flexible. And um, being based in Lincoln, I can get to um, just about any point in Nebraska mm -hmm. or any point east into Iowa with equal ease. And um, it's my intention to do as many of these events as, as I possibly can. Um, as far as what I'm looking forward to, it's, it's exactly that. It's, getting out and talking to people, um, getting the opportunity to hear people's reactions to the book. The, the book has been out for a little over a year in hardback, so I've had the opportunity to do some events around uh, Nebraska and Iowa already, and every single time I'm impressed by the, the sort of diversity of experience that, that people bring to those events. Uh, I've had farmers who arrive at the events who very much agree with with the uh, the challenges as the Hammonds sort of perceive them and um, are in their camp, and others who strongly disagree with with the way that the Hammonds uh, are looking to solve some of the problems of modern agriculture. And seeing the farmers get into dialogue with each other is fantastic. And of course, with these events often being hosted in town, seeing town people getting to interact with farmers and talk up through those issues has also been uh, really exciting and gratifying. And so my ambition as much as possible is to provide an opportunity for, for people to come together and discuss these things. As I said at the outset, there's, there's no question that some of the issues that are raised in the book are, are complex and that they are sometimes contentious, but I don't think that reading about those issues and then getting together to talk about them is divisive by any means. I think it's just the opposite. And seeing people not in their isolated camps bickering with each other online, but actually coming into a room together talking about uh, a shared set of facts that come from a book that they've all read and and are equally informed on and then bringing their own experience to that and um, using that as a platform for for conversation I, I think it's the best possible outcome that we could hope for and I'm really excited to, to see that play out over the year and we have a quick follow-up what's the best way for libraries and book groups and bookstores to get a hold of you to schedule events Right, so um, there, there's been a sort of uh, sudden rush of, of interest, and um, so I'm I'm a little backlogged. You you can uh, you can reach me directly, um, and my email address is is as simple as it could be. It's just my last name. It's genoways at gmail dot com. Mm -hmm. um, you can also uh, if you look on the website, you'll see that 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 my publicist at Norton. His email address is there. That's Will Scarlett, and um, Will will be working with Tessa to keep a, a calendar that's current, so that um, uh, I can see what what days I'm already booked, and also hopefully uh, then 
try to, especially for some of the trips that, that require distant travel, try to group uh, some of the events together so that um, I'm not driving the, the same uh, stretch of I-80 over and over again, but hopefully can, uh, can group some of those things together. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's a scarcity of books right now, um, but I just got the uh, really outstanding news from Norton this morning that they're going into a second printing of the, of the paperback, and they assure me that we'll have more than enough copies um, very soon. That's awesome. And so, yeah, yeah that's, it's wonderful <laughs> news. It's really great. And um, it's a testament to the, to the sort of the interest uh, in the book. And, uh, and so the, the, the plan will be to try to um, have most of the events, I guess, uh, after those, those books are more available so that anyone who, who wants to be able to buy a copy and, and uh, read it will, will have them on hand. I know we also do have the image of the book groups in um, online too, as ebooks and audiobooks. Right. Both Iowa and Nebraska have them in our collections in Overdrive, uh, both versions there. That's so great. that is something that you, how you like to read your books or listen to your books, um, they are in there um, as well. That's great. Uh, um, do you know anything about a large print edition coming soon? You know, I don't know anything about a large print edition. I um, I know that there's the audio version. Um, I I would say that um, in in my opinion, the audio edition is is not the, the absolute ideal way to experience this. That um, the, the the reader of the book was not especially well versed in some of the the terms. Uh, and hearing um, you know hearing somebody talk about a combine is not always the best. Thing. Oh. <laughs> um, so the uh, so but my my understanding is that there's that there's also uh, a a version of it that that has been created um, that that is specifically for uh, the the blind and dyslexic that Are is working. Yeah. 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 Our talking book and rails. I was just wondering about yeah. that. Just we heard they're working on finishing that up, I think. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So, so, yeah. So, if you're a Nebraska Talking Book and Braille user, we have um, just Blessed Earth available for you hopefully soon. They're just finishing up mm -hmm. the reporting, finishing touches on that. So, that will be available. That's great. Um, our last question that we have on our um, comment blog is. Um, what did you hope to accomplish by writing the book, and has that happened? Well, my my hope in in writing the book was to try to present um, farmers in in a in a more complex light than they they often are. Um, I think that that we have a tendency to think of um, farm life as sort of pastoral and removed from the worries of the world. And what I wanted people to see was that, in fact, the the farm, though it's isolated, it really sits at a kind of crossroads of so many national and international issues. And so many things that we would think of as being far removed from the farm, energy policy and in, international uh, conflicts like the Iraq and, and Afghanistan wars, um, they run directly through um, these sorts of areas, and and often because they're isolated, um, and because they are increasingly depopulated, they tend to be politically ignored. They they are taken for granted, and um, and don't become part of the discussions that are so central and and determining of of their lives and their legacies. And so I I most of all wanted to have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with one family for them to be able to not think of this as a kind of quick hit interview where they had to tell their story in 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 a rapid way and and make themselves immediately understood but where we both spent the time um to to really come to understand this family and to try to portray them in all of their complexity. And 
Um, and of course, then my hope was, you know, if you're if you're saying that you want to, to provide a platform for people, um, my hope is that that the book goes out um, to a wide readership and and allows them to be heard by the, the largest group of people possible. Mm -hmm. And certainly with this joint selection by One Book One Nebraska and All Iowa Reads, that's that's a huge. Uh, step in the, in that process to to make so many people aware of the book and to have the kind of infrastructure that allows me to get out and to to talk to so many people about this book. Um, so yes, I I, I think uh, I wouldn't say that it's that it succeeded all the way yet. I think we're still in yeah, the process. Just in January. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but this is a really exciting first step. Um, let's pop over to the other slideshow. Sure, if you want to. Oh. Um, let's get to that. And hang on a here. I'm uh, also going to switch this back. So they're going to do the thing. There. Yes. Okay. Let's go. So, like I said, we have book club kits circulating from the Nebraska Library Commission. I believe some of the systems offices have their own book club kits. They all have each one of them has yeah. their own. Yeah, each of our four regional systems has that as well. Yeah. So if our book club kit is um, reserved, when you want it, um, check with one of your your system directors and see if they have more available schedules. Um, you can find more information on our One Book One Nebraska website. Um, we've got a little blurb of it there so you can see what it looks like you know you're in the right place and we do have an event news and events page where we will have a calendar of places Ted will be so that you can keep up with him and know if he's in your area we also have a Facebook page dedicated to the one book one Nebraska that we we share events on um, whether it's a public library event a bookstore um, or it's just a little glimpse of what Ted's been up to. Let's see. And then we always want to make um, resources available to anyone who wants to have an event. So we have bookmarks and promotional uh, business cards available. You can get in contact with the commission and get a package of those sent to you if you want to have those available at your library or bookstore. And like we mentioned before, you can contact himself and schedule an event. The last thing we wanted to make sure we mentioned is that we kind of have a culminating event at the end of the year in the fall where we celebrate the current One Book One Nebraska and have a presentation on the book and then we also announce next year's One Book. So we don't have a date yet for this year's celebration so keep an eye out for that but it is always a really great time to hear from Nebraska authors and mm -hmm. I always go away with a new book list of yeah. books that I have to read. So, um, I so I have a question about the yeah. book haul. That um, now you had mentioned that we this is a joint between Iowa and Nebraska, and I believe that's also related to the fact that the Nebraska Library Association and the Iowa Library Association uh, Association are doing a joint um, annual conference this fall as well. Mm -hmm. So, is that something that you are going to be participating in, or do you know yes, yet that, that you're going to be? That's certainly my plan. Yes. They have I know they're still working on. They they, um, they don't have a schedule out yet exactly. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my that's my intent. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, and that will be in La Vista, Nebraska, yeah. so closer to the border, but so that people, all the all the people from Iowa and Nebraska can mm -hmm. meet up there. Yeah. And I think we already have you. Um, earmarked for the Nebraska Book Festival as well um, on September 7th. So he's going to be one of our speakers for that. That, that, is, that, is, that we already have yeah. <laughs> in September. September. The NLA and ILA conference is in October. You're going to be busy. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds great. That's perfect. Do we have any last minute questions or um, anything else? Anything anyone else wants to share? Christine, anybody? Type into the question section if you want to. I would just um, encourage people to also visit the Nebraska Center for the Book website and Facebook page to watch for other events related not only to the One Book, One Nebraska, but letters about literature and a variety of other things <clears throat> um, that we participate in. Definitely. Great point. 
those are all linked off of the one book page too, yes. correct? Yes. So, so they're, they're all kind of there. Yeah. Circular. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of cooperation. Yes, yes, definitely. And if you're in Iowa, check out the Iowa pages. State Library Iowa, <laughs> their Center for the Book, their All Iowa Reads website for um, Iowa specific okay. events and information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the last slide that we have is my information. Um, I'm a great way to find out information about the One Book program as well. If you have anything, we have one more. Question. Yeah, interesting. Are you, are you going to be visiting the Iowa State Fair in August? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm like, well, the Nebraska State Fair. I don't, I, I don't want to create too much. Uh, Buzz that I may be running in 2020, um, but uh, you know, my I, I would love to do any events like this sort of thing. Uh, I don't have any plans for for state or county fairs yet, but uh, I'm open to invitations. Yeah. Who who doesn't love the opportunity to see things sculpted out of butter? Absolutely. <laughs> Send them to to Ted Stage to get in touch with them about it. Yeah, if you want them to come to your fair. Yes. I think we're getting close to being out of time. No problem. All right. Anybody doesn't have any last minute urgent questions? Any last words before we do our wrap up? I don't think so. Just uh, feel free to be in contact with me if you have any questions, and I look forward to, to hearing from people. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Just turn the camera towards me. I'll tell you stop. Good. Stop. All right. <laughs> This is all very manual. We're high tech here. Sort of. <laughs> anyway, oh, so thank you so much, Ted, and um, everyone else for being here with us this morning. Um, this is great to hear about you. We do this every year, and we're glad to promote it, and we hope. Okay. Um, okay. Something that just popped up, but it's for afterwards. No problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and we hope everyone will read the book and come to all the any of the sessions, any of the um, events we're going to be going to, and reach out to them for more things to do. So you can travel instead of write. <laughs> this year is what we're going to do. All right. So we we'll going to escape over there, and I am going to hop out to our website. Uh, so this is the Nebraska Library Commission website, and I'm actually going to go to, can you type in M Compass Live? I'm going to show you where we're going to have the archive of today's show. It has been recorded, is being recorded. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And so far, Encompass Live is the only thing called Encompass Live on the internet. <laughs> awesome. So uh, you can find it on our website, but if you just Google us, it's up. So uh, this is the main page for the show uh, where we've got our upcoming shows here, but just underneath that is a link to our archives, and this is where you'll find all of our um, shows here. Today's show will be posted up here probably later today, as long as YouTube and everything cooperates with me. And it'll be at the top of the list, the most recent one's at the top there. We'll have a link to the recording, a link to the slides, um, the slides and the photographs, if you don't mind. We sure would we'll post those as well, as well so people yep. look through. Uh, everyone who attended today and registered for today will get an email from me, let you know it's available, and then we post it out to our various social media. I'll let you know while we're here on the archives page that we do have a search feature here. It's just recently been added. Um, but this is actually the beginning of the 11th year of Encompass Live. Uh, one book, one Nebraska is a little older than the show, <laughs> our show. And this is our entire archive here. I won't scroll all the way down, but if you did scroll all the way down, you'd find it's all going back to January 2009. So that you can find what you're looking for on a certain topic, we have a search feature. Uh, you can look for the, through the entire history of the show or just most recent 12 months, you want know, something really up to date. So do keep that in mind when you are watching our archives. Look at the date of the show. Um, everything does have a date on it, so you know when it was originally broadcast. There will be some old information. There will be expired things. Uh, services don't exist. Things aren't going on anymore. Possibly broken links to different websites and whatnot. But we are librarians. This is what we do. We archive things. So our entire history is there um, for you to go ahead and look through. So please do take a look at that. And um, we are also on Facebook. We have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. You can click there to get to it. We post reminders of our shows that are coming up, uh, let you know when the archives are available. Here's the log info to log into today's show. So um, please do give us a like if you do like to keep up on things on Facebook. 
And I hope you join us for next week's show when it, our topic is information literacy and the ESL ELL students uh, alleviating uh, library anxiety. Um, two of our librarians from the uh, University of Omaha Chris Library, uh, Claire Chamley and Aaron Painter, will be with us to talk about how they are working with their um, English with student language and English language learners students who are having um, you know, issues with being you know, concerned about how am I going to get my work done in college. So if you're at a university, this would be a topic for you. So please do join us for next week's show or any of the other shows that we do have on the schedule here. Any days that aren't on here, we'll be filling in um, please. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you everybody for being here with us this morning. And we will hopefully see you next time on Income Live. Bye-bye.